watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. All right, 10 o'clock, how are you guys doing today? It's good to be with you as we kick off a brand new series, Kidnap. Now, uh, in honor of this series, I decided to wear my Camp Kid Jam shirt. We had a lot of fun with third through fifth grade kids. If you have never been around a large group of third through fifth grade kids, just take all the smells that happen in middle school, take the energy of toddlers and throw it in a blender mixed with a lot of talk that I will not repeat. And it was an amazing week of camp. They worship. I tell you what. They put you guys to shame when it comes to worship. They dance, they sing, they shout. And for some of you guys are like, yeah, I worship. And you're like, my hands go right about here. Little field goal worship. <laughs> and we're right here. Like they, they crush it. It was so cool to hang out with them and be a part. We sent kids away to CIY Mix with our middle schoolers. We had some high schoolers that went away with our team Mexico and well, we have some amazing things happening for young people. And you may think as we approach a series called Kidnap, you go, well, I don't have kids, so the series ends up for me. You're wrong. You may say, well, I have older kids. They're long gone. This series isn't for me. You, my friends, are also wrong. You may say, I have no interest in young people. They bother me. Get off my lawn. <laughs> this series is not for me, you need to let people on your lawn. And yes, this series is for you. No matter where you find yourself in life, this series is much more than about kids birth to 18 years old. This is about what it means when you have a culture and a, and a God over here and a nemesis over here, Satan that wants nothing more than to not completely derail you from your faith, but to pull you just enough away that you feel like you're there, but you're actually not. The illusion of following Jesus and yet not actually following Jesus. You see, you could be 101 or one, and this culture can kidnap you. And over the next four weeks, we're going to look at, no matter what your age and what your influence, are you possibly kidnapped and not even know it? And if you have come to know Jesus, what are you doing with the influence that you have? And today starts that journey, and I'm praying for us that this won't be about our feelings. This won't be about the misconceptions that we have. This won't be about, well, I feel like within my faith, I do. That we would take a step back and go, God, help me to be teachable. Help me to listen and help me respond. That's been my prayer for you as we've led up to this. And if this lands, and I love hearing people say this, they go, man, I really needed to hear that. You guys knew you had a camera in my house. You've been like stalking my email and all these things. One, we are not the CIA. We do not have that kind of budget. We're a nonprofit. Two, we plan our series out a year in advance. And so the action is not on us, it's on God. God knew what you were going through. God knew you needed to hear whatever you came for. God knows exactly what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And so as we start this journey, I want to pray for us that we'll be teachable, that we'll be receptive, and that we'll take action. Why don't you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this series that we get to start something new today something that could revolutionize not only our individual life, but the lives of our friends, family, and generations coming up behind us about what it means to trust you. 
God, help us to be teachable. Help us to receive it and help us to respond in a way that means that you are working and not us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you guys, by show of hands, have ever enjoyed all that is Target or Target to the less informed? Yeah, we absolutely love this store, and I had the opportunity to go with my daughters and take them as they had money to go shop for a toy. And if you're new with us, I have daughters that are nine, seven, and two. I, you can pray if you want. People are like, well, we'll be praying for you. We're raising up our daughters well. I'm praying for you if you're raising up sons. Do your job so they have somebody to pick later on. So we're taking care of them. Uh, you do your job. I'll do mine. And so brought them to Target to go get a toy. And so I set the two older ones loose. And I'm with the two-year-old. She's wandering around. I'm like, Kinley, what are you going to get? She said, toys. And she's wandering around doing her thing that two-year-olds do. And we're talking, and I stop with the older ones as they're beginning to look at toys, and they have their money waving around. I'm like, put your money away, but I need to know how much I have. You know how much you have. Put it in your pocket. You're going to drop it. Sure enough, they're dropping stuff. We're collecting it. And finally, stop and talk with our oldest kids, and they're wanting to ask a question about the math to be able to buy certain toys. And as I'm engaging them, talking about their questions, and then I turn, and Kinley's gone. And if you're a parent, you know this thought process. It starts, to, it starts low and it begins to stair step. But the anxiety happens from zero to 100. And I immediately go, hey, girls, have you seen Kinley? Did you see where she went, whatever? And I immediately go to the end of the aisle and I go around and she's not there. Kinley, Kinley Jane, where are you? And I run down and I go, start looking around. Kinley, where are you? And another parent comes around. Hey, are you okay? I said, my daughter, Kinley, she's, she's two, trying to find her. Kinley Jane, Kinley! Where are you? I'm running up and down the toy section aisles trying to find her. And another parent steps in. Are you okay? Can you find my daughter, Kinley? She's a, she has like darker blonde hair. I need to find her. I don't know where she is. Girls, stay there. And I'm running around trying to find her. An employee comes over. Sir, can we help you? I can't find my daughter. I don't know where she is. And by now, I'm ramped up. And, and if you have ever lost a kid, you know that you're just everything, all the worst case scenarios. And I know the stats that since the 70s, that child abduction are drastically down. The problem is we hear about them all the way across the country, so it makes us think that they're always happening. And so I go, no, what's going on? And we're running around, and I'm like, oh, no, no, she wanted to go to the electronics. She likes to pretend she's playing the video games, and I run over to electronics, and she's not there. And as I'm over in electronics, off the end cap, because I couldn't see her, we were all searching down this side, down the middle aisle, as she stood in an end cap, she turns around and go, I, I hear Daddy. And I lost it. I'm in tears. And I run over and I grab her. I'm like, baby, what are you doing? I told you to stay with me. Why'd you go away? And she said, I fixed doggy. And if you don't know, this is Doc McStuffins. And she's a doctor and she fixes toys. She saw that doggy needed help. So she wanted to fix him. If you don't know about Doc McStuffins, thank Jesus. <laughs> so she's standing there and I kind of knock the toy out of her way and I get down on her and I'm holding her. I'm like, don't you run away from me. I told you to stay with me. And I had already told her, she had looked at this earlier and I told her, no, she said, use daddy's money. I'm like, oh no, daddy doesn't have money. I'm married, baby. Um, <laughs> only the married people laugh. If you're engaged, just get used to it now. And, and so I'm hugging her and I'm holding her. Man, the thoughts that went through my head. When you lose something you love, you will go to any length to find it. But what about the things you don't love? The things that aren't that is attached to you. The people that aren't quite as attached to you. Yeah, our hearts go out in, in moments. We use uh, clever, very innovative hashtags of praying for whoever across social networking. We may even change our profile picture to add a ribbon on there. But what about the people who are truly lost without God? Does your heart break for them? And not only does it break, 
For those who don't know Jesus, if you claim Jesus, you know that by Jesus' truth, he says that all that come to me will inherit eternal life, but all that have not come to me, while they have opportunity to, if they choose by their own free will choice not to, they will not celebrate in eternity with me. That should stir up in us something. If you're a follower of Jesus, that should change the urgency of what you do in life to be able to share with other people. You see, because there are generations from 100 to 1 who have had moments where they have been kidnapped by the culture and by an adversary that wants nothing more than to make us believe that we're just good enough. You know, and, and if we can be honest in church, it should be a place where honesty can reside. There are moments where I don't want to go and do things that lost people aren't, that people that don't know Jesus aren't the top priority for me. Ironically, yesterday I was going through reviewing my sermon for today and my wife texts me as she's outside. Hey, my neighbor who had, uh, she had broken her foot and he was getting a ramp that he had rented to set up out there. She said, hey, so-and-so is out there getting a ramp. You should help him. And I said, I'm really trying to go over my message about helping teach people how to love other people. I don't, and, and I, as I'm responding, I go, I'm about to tell her I don't have time to love people because I need to talk about and review a sermon to tell other people how to love people. And I was like, meh face, head outside. And I help him with the ramp and I go back inside and I have the conversation with my wife. Why'd you text me? You knew I was being there. Well, maybe you should actually practice what you preach. If you've ever had a moment where you didn't want to interrupt your schedule to love people, I get it. I have those moments too. I love my dear friend, uh, Vince, who started this church. He wrote this book called Gorilla Lovers. And in the book, he, he quoted, uh, he, he writes this piece, and, it, and it's so beautifully said, shares this. He says, what we want to do in this moment is rarely what's best for us. And what's best for us in our minds is keep my schedule, do my thing, serve myself, not others. We need to take a longer view of life and realize that to become someone worth becoming, who are you becoming? Are you becoming more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Every day you are becoming one of the two. If you don't know Jesus, you are still becoming either more like him or less like him with every choice you make. The person becoming, I probably, you probably need to do things that we don't want to be doing. Why? Because it's in those moments that the, the, the rub of, well, I don't want to help people because I got something going on. And God goes, hey, all those things you believe and that you go to and that you preach and that you live and when you share, check in on Facebook. Man, I love being here. But do you love living it? In the series Kidnap, there's a lot of people who are waiting on you. Boomers want to talk with you gently and lovingly, but you are no longer the largest generation in culture in North America. Millennials have overtaken you. 75.6 million people in the millennial generation. And I know what you may or may not have said about them. They're entitled, they're lazy, they're fill in the blank. I've watched people do this. You know my wife's a millennial? Say my wife's lazy? That changes the conversation. You know, millennials are some of the, actually, in that generation, some of the hardest working people. They've started more nonprofits to end more diseases, to give more to other people than any other generation group combined. And there's plenty of them that don't know Jesus. And posting memes about laziness doesn't help them. It only pushes them further away from Jesus. Hey, not only are those people not like me because they're older, but they're Christian I probably don't want to follow their Jesus. You know, when we get a little younger, do you know that 93% of people who claim faith even up into adulthood, that they come to faith before the age of 18? 
before the age of 18, 93%. And so if you found yourself as an adult claiming faith, you were only part of the 7% past 18 that makes that 93%. And of that 93%, I want to back up to make sure that I'm correct in this by Barna and Pew Research, 87% make a decision to follow Jesus and stick with it before middle school. Do you think that it matters how we pour into people who are younger than us? The answer to that question is yes. You see, there are plenty of people who are lost and don't even know it. My daughter didn't know that she was lost. She actually wasn't being deceitful. She actually wasn't being wrong. Now, she did wander off and I told her to stay there. She wasn't being malicious, but she needed someone to find her. And there are plenty of people who need your influence if you claim faith. But the first thing that we have to rewind and step back is, well, in this idea of being kidnapped, everyone either is or has been kidnapped. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn over to the book of Isaiah. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. It's over in Isaiah 53. If you don't have a Bible, we give them away for free at the Get Connected table, or you can go to our online Get Connected table, ForefrontChurch.info, and go to the Need a Bible tab, download a Bible app, or our personal favorite, the Forefront Church app, that has all the notes that we're talking about today and everything we've included and fill in the blank. So if you're OCD and you just, and like, you need everything, or if you're ADD and you're listening to me and then you're thinking, lunch or squirrel, and then you can follow along and keep on track right inside there. Over in Isaiah chapter 53, we find out this truth that all of us either are or have been kidnapped. Starting in verse 1, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like the root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire in him. This is foretelling, foreshadowing prophesying the movement, life, and death and resurrection of Jesus. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain, like one whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted. And I love verses 5 and 6. This is the hope that we have. This is why we worship, why we share, why we give, why we serve. But he was pierced for our transgressions, that he took our place. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, not us, that we deserved, on him, and by his wounds we were healed. Verse 6, and you can highlight, circle it. No, you will not get struck by lightning if you write in your Bible. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us have been kidnapped at some point in time. For some of us, even in this moment right now, we haven't made a decision for Jesus, and we are spiritually and emotionally kidnapped because we're walking through an existence that God didn't plan for us, that God wants better for us, that God has a plan for us. And if you don't know that. I want you to know that God has a plan for you. That's why you're here. That's why you believe. You wouldn't wake up and come here if you didn't believe that there is the possibility that the divine creator of all mankind and all the world and all the universe believed enough in you that he created you unique and specific in design and that you believe that there was a bigger purpose than just waking up, hanging out, sleeping in, watching Netflix, going to the beach, sleeping and doing it all over again. You go, man, there has to be something more. We've all been kidnapped at one point in time or another. And what do we do with that? How do we move in that? And I would share this. It's not our main idea, but it helps us along. You cannot move in the mission, and we walk past it every week. People helping people find and follow Jesus. Until you believe there's a moment to be reclaimed. I meet plenty of people that love the idea of loving people. They go, oh, this is a good idea. People that need Jesus, let's find love, care for them. And then we go, cool, help. And they go, "Mm, my schedule's a little busy. This is why, this is why this happens. You cannot move in the mission to be people helping people find and follow Jesus until you believe there is a moment to be reclaimed that people matter to God, that they are made unique, that they have a soul, and that their soul is destitute without him. And it is 
beautifully blooming and celebrated with him. If you don't believe that, then you will never move in the mission that God has for you. But if you do, then this truth, if you follow Jesus, should be absolutely evident in your life. And if you don't follow Jesus, uh, not only am I glad you're here, but I want you to know that Christians should be held to a higher standard. I believe what you've shared on chat rooms and on Reddit and message boards and social media and in conversation at barbecues, that if Christians are going to talk the talk, then they need to what? Walk the walk. That they need to put their money where their mouth is. And I believe that Christians should rise and be the pinnacle of art, music, design, love, serving, being a part of our community, that we would look and go, man, Christians are setting the pace. And if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I want Christians to know this, that kidnapped people need Christians to go places, do things, and love in ways that others won't. That your life would be pointedly different and that people that don't know God go, what? And it's not to point back at me and go, hashtag blessed. Like, look, that your life, that people would see, and they go, why is your life so different? And you go, because I love this guy named Jesus who saved me. And I'm a part of a community that's not about ourselves. We're about the people that aren't here now. We're, we're here for people like you. Not as a project just to show you love, because God does the work on their heart. You're, just, you're sent to love. But that your life, where you go, and what you do, and how you love, would be drastically different. That it would change people. And it would change in generations that need you. Not only your friends and people older than you and around your same age, but the generations, if those stats are indeed true, which there's been plenty of research through Barna Group and Pew Research to say that millennials are the largest generation, then stop posting memes and quit using rhetoric that they're lazy. They're not. There's just as many lazy boomers that I've met. They just sit around complaining about other generations. Get up off your tail and do something. I don't want to pour into them. They don't know. You can't complain about a problem and not help with a solution. Because people who love Jesus say, I will pour into others. I will not be about my sell because Jesus wasn't if we follow Jesus and Jesus was about others and then we get upset that Jesus calls us to love and go be about others then we're not really following Jesus now are we now there's two things that kind of help with this if you follow Jesus one of these things and it's a good reminder and if you don't it helps you in this to understand this to be true and the first one is this here that this idea of being kidnapped, it's been you or is you, and you can't forget that. If you're a believer, you can't forget where God found you. Because when you forget where God found you, you get really comfortable. It's like the, the illustration that's done where they throw a frog in a pot, and then they start turning on the water and making it hot, and after a while, the frog's fine with it. The frog will swim around, and the frog won't ever try to get out, even when it's hot. It'll think that it can adapt and adapt and adapt. Eventually, the frog will die in that pot. It'll just, oh, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to figure it out, I'm going to figure it out. And it gets complacent, and then it just, it's done. I meet plenty of Christians who sit in Christianity and just kind of do Christianity instead of living it, and they forget where God found them. I remember where God found me. Not just when my parents drugged me to church when I didn't want to go. I remember specifically a concert that I went to when I was in high school where the current laser tag kind of thing is over there by uh, Lynn Haven uh, Parkway it used to be a skate park. And I went to a concert where it was all bands that, that I didn't know this at the time. It was all Christian, like I, they believed in Christianity bands, but it was like 
not just metal, I'm talking screaming. And if you don't, my wife does a great impression of this. And if you can get her to do it on video, I've been trying all of our marriage, I'll give you 50 bucks. She will never do this on video. But she says, I don't understand why they do that. And this is what, she's like, I love Jesus. Why am I so angry? And she does all this stuff and it's, it's funny. And um, I keep challenging her to make a band and like find some people together. Um, maybe you could spur that dream on. But I went to this thing, and I didn't know that these bands were Christian. And one of the bands in particular, he had turned his drum set around facing the wall because he was playing so heavy that he kept knocking over his double bass pedal and drum. I mean, it was nuts. And he walks out, and he is, like, fully tattooed. He looks like he fell face first into a tackle box. He has so many piercings. And he's smoking a cigarette. And I walk outside because I was like, this band's awesome. And I'm talking to the drummer, and we're just talking. And... um. And along the way, he says that he believes in Jesus. I'm like, what? You, no. You're, like, you're covered in tattoos, and you're, you got a lot. And at the time, I also had, like, colored hair and piercings, but I didn't really follow Jesus. And so for me, it made sense. But for him, I was like, that's not, and you're smoking. Like, you're going to die. Like, you're, I got all this stuff. And he's, and I love what he said to me. He said, you've been told a lot of lies about what it means to be Christian, I think. And it totally changed. From that point forward, I started looking things totally different. It got me down a road where I was like, wow. But the state that I was in, I remember vividly the way the converse, conversation went, the way it smelled, the look of everything. I, like, it was yesterday. You want to know how I remember that? Because I remember where people used to be in those moments just like I was, not sure if I wanted to live, not sure if I wanted to take another breath felt alone, anxiety-ridden, and depressed. And it took a guy that never would have been invited to my parents' church at the time, sharing with me, I think you've been told some lies about faith. You know what? I remember the point that I was kidnapped and what God helped me out of. And if you're a Christian this morning, I want you to remember where God found you. Because when you remember the freshness of where God found you, You remember the joy it was to be found and what it meant to move in that and then help other people. Everybody who comes to Jesus gets baptized. You know what? In the first year, they win more people by introducing them to church, faith, and God. And then I meet people who have been Christians for like decades. They go, I don't really have a lot of Christian friends. I was like, you need to get some new friends. They're like, well, making friends is hard as an adult. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, like, but like, I just, I don't understand. I, and I'm sorry, like, I don't even get that mentality. They're like, well, where do I find new friends? I was like, pick up a freaking hobby. Like, do something, like, go meet some people, but that's really hard. I'm really an introvert. I don't really know. And I do whatever. I was like, wait a second. If you love Jesus and the mission matters, this is why if you don't believe, you can't move in the mission until you believe that there's moments to be redeemed, that there's people that need saving. And so if you don't, if you've lost the fact that this matters, then you're not going to do any of that. And the thing is, I meet people in their 40s, 50s, 60s who are reaching people for Jesus. So don't tell me it's because of your age. Don't tell me it's because of your friend circle, whatever, because I meet people all the time and I go, you're awesome. And they're like, yeah, just tell people everywhere I meet, like at the grocery store, when we're out, or when we meet people. I'm like, you meet people? I was like, hey, I want you to go introduce you to this person that's been following Jesus for like five years, and they just feel like they can't do anything. I want you to introduce, they're like, hey, let's talk about, hey, they're 65, and they're doing a way better job than you. And they're like, why? Because sometimes we need a fire lit underneath us to remind us where we were to go, wow, Jesus still loved me then, he loves me now, and he loves those people that I don't want to get up and do anything with because I'm busy looking over my sermon or because I'm busy on Netflix or because I'm busy taking a nap because I had a long day or I'm busy because of my kids. If you have kids, you have one of the greatest opportunities to help meet other people. Just go to a park. It's going to happen. Why? I know I got three of them. We are constantly meeting new people, usually because they hurt one another. Kidnap people need Christians who will go out and do these things. And you've been kidnapped or you are kidnapped. You need to remember where you've been. Second piece, really quick. And I, I, I left this off because when I wrote this at first, I wrote, because I was thinking through this, kidnap people need courageous Christians. 
to go places and do things and love in ways they don't. I, I, and I took it out because I want you to know, if you do this, you're not courageous, you're commanded. Sometimes we build up those people, and this is what happens. We build up a culture. There's a guy, there's this story going around of this guy that's, that like loves his wife, but his wife has a more curvy figure, and everyone's celebrating this guy. They're like, oh, he doesn't care about body image. He doesn't care about whatever. And like, they're like, this is so amazing. I'm like, why are we celebrating the guy for loving his wife? That's something you're just supposed to do. He's not courageous. He's doing his job as a husband. And then all of a sudden we think, oh, that Christian, they are super Christian. They've done all this stuff and they do it. No, they're not. They're living a life of what it means to be a Christian. And this is where it gets really rocky because if you claim Jesus, now just let's park this for people who follow Jesus. If you don't follow Jesus yet, you just sit and eat the popcorn and watch this happen. If you say you follow Jesus and you aren't using your influence, and we're going to talk about this next week, if you're not using your influence for the people around you, and, and very much so for millennials and younger people, because 93% of people come to faith before the age of 18, and 87% of them before middle school, if you aren't leveraging your influence in that spot, because that's what's happening, they need you, they're feeling awkward, there's all kinds of ch -ch -ch changes going on, and they need you to be a part, and you're like, meh, I don't really feel like doing that. But Jesus has called you, they're lost, they need you, they need your influence. I would question, is there the possibility you're squandering your opportunity to actually love Jesus? And let's even take that a step further. Dare I say, are you really moving in what it means to be a follower of Jesus if you're not giving it away? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you'll obey my commandments and you'll do this. You're not courageous when you follow Jesus and pour it out. You're doing what he told you to do. It's just like when I tell my daughters to brush their teeth and then they, have, then they don't do it and then they have rotten out teeth. I don't go, Meh. no, I, I tell them to brush it. Why it's what you're supposed to do to be able to have that. And in the same way as you follow Jesus, it's not a choice to serve others. It's a command. So the choice now is how do I do that? I don't need to pray about, I need to pray a long time before I serve people. No, Jesus did it, you do it. I need to really pray before I put that ramp up. No, Jesus did, you do it. I need to pray before I help this lady in the middle of traffic. No, Jesus did it, you do it. I love this quote that Jed Wilhite shares. Helps me out a lot. I choose to suppress the initial categories I want to put people in. Rich, poor, together, not together, druggy, yuppie, rocker, loser, winner, cool, uncool. I choose to remember that I don't know their struggle or their pain. I choose to err on the side of grace because someday I'll stand before God and he'll err, and I pray he'll err on the side of grace with me. You want to follow Jesus? You use your influence and help those that are kidnapped from the kingdom of God, help them meet the one who can set them free. But it starts with your own relationship. Do you believe enough in the mission to actually move in the moments of redemption? Because kidnapped people need Christians who will go places, do things, and love in ways that others won't. And so if you're a believer today, the question is, are you? And what are you going to do about it? Would you pray with me? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then. Peace. Yeah.